Turn to the book of Acts, and uh, we are in chapter 15 this morning, beginning in verse 36, and we'll cover a little bit of ground today as Paul begins his second missionary journey. So I hope you've been enjoying the journey. I know I have. I love God's word, and I hope you do too. I think you do. That's why you're here, and uh, that's how we grow, and uh, we'll even be talking about that this morning as well. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that we have. Um, as we just turn the pages and we come to the book of Acts, how exciting it is to see the birth of the church and how what you began 2,000 years ago has continued. It's gone from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, and continues to go out. And we're just so thankful for those who shared the gospel with us. We pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts for the lost as well. So bless your word as uh, we see Paul going out and pressing himself to share his faith. Lord, help us to do that in our area, in our sphere of influence as well. Bless your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. So again, we've entitled the book of Acts uh, Momentum because that's what we're seeing, this incredible momentum. Um, it really is a great uh, you know, name for a series or a book because we see the Holy Spirit just continuing to go out and see souls saved, and, and we continue to see that today. We see souls saved in our own fellowship. We see that happening around the world, and God is faithful. He is continuing to fill his house, as Jesus said in the parable. Now, this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 36, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 16 and verse 10. This is really one theme of thought as we're looking at Paul's second missionary outreach to the lost. Now, since the birth of the church, which we saw in Acts chapter 2, and until this present day, God's people have been sharing their faith. They've been evangelizing with the lost, and rightly so. Uh, J. Hudson Taylor, that great uh, missionary uh, to um, China, said this, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. That is so true. And we're always trying to remind ourselves of this. Uh, it says that in big giant letters when you walk out the doorway, you're now entering the mission field. It says that in our signs as we leave the parking lot. You're entering the mission field. We always want to remind ourselves there are so many people that don't know Jesus. And so we often fail to share our faith. That might be you. You, you might get nervous, you might be a little sh uh, scared, maybe you don't feel like I know enough. Well, listen, we're always growing in our walks, but we want to press ourselves and share our faith because God is so good. It's good, and that's why we call it good news. This world has nothing but bad news. I, I read some of it, so it's, it's constantly bad news, but we've got good news in Jesus, amen? So I pray that we'll have a greater passion as we look at these passages, these verses before us this morning. Now, as Paul talks about evangelism, about sharing, and as we see him doing that, he doesn't stand up and give a sermon on how to share your faith and so forth, but what you have is his life example. You have his, his life as an example, and really, that's the best way to uh, take on spiritual truth. It's not do as I say, but do as I do. And the Apostle Paul really did it. So that said, I, I've entitled our message this morning Effective Evangelism as Paul is continuing to reach out and share his faith with the lost. And there are five principles that I'm outlining here in this passage that we see. We've placed them there in your outline, in your bulletin. Effective evangelism takes place when there is proper discipleship. That's an important part. When we're exercising discernment, when we're making wise decisions, as there is the proper or the right declaration, the gospel, which is grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and the proper direction. We're gonna see all those as we move through here this morning. Now, we begin with proper discipleship. This is verse 36. Uh, but I need to recap where we've been, especially if you're just joining us here this morning for the first time. Um, in the first part of this chapter, we saw that there were certain Jews, they were Jewish, but they, were, they had been converted to Christianity, but they were 
uh, Judaizers. What that means is, is they were Christians, but they believed if, that you were, if you were a Gentile, then you had to first become a Jew, and then you could become a Christian. And so you needed to obey all the dietary laws. You had to get circumcised and so forth. And, and so they were seeking to add uh, works to the work of God. In other words, it was grace plus the law, or grace plus works. And so Paul and Barnabas, of course, uh, locked horns with these guys and said, no, it's through faith in Jesus Christ, period. And so there was a council called in Jerusalem to settle the issue once and for all. And the decision, of course, was unanimous. It's biblical. Salvation comes through grace and faith in Christ alone, period. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to uh, uh, obey all the dietary laws of the Old Testament. You don't have to perform certain rituals and so forth. And so Paul and Barnabas then returned back from Jerusalem to the church in Antioch. This was really the center hub of what God was doing at that time. They reported to the church all these things. And when they went, they were also accompanied by two other gentlemen, a man by the name of Judas, obviously not Judas Iscariot, he was off the scene by now, and a man named Silas. Now Judas would eventually go back to the church in Jerusalem, but Silas stayed on here in Antioch, and we'll see he eventually plays a key role. So... We come to these verses this morning, beginning in verse 36, and we read, then after some days, so now that Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Jesus, they're all there now, the church gathered in Antioch, they're back to their regular services and all, and Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go. Now, I love this. I just stop right there because I love the heart of Paul. He has been on this missionary endeavor for two years. He has to deal with his council. He's back in the church, but he says, you know what? Uh, we, there are more people that need to know Christ. Paul had such a passion for the lost, and I pray we have that same passion as well. Listen to heart, uh, the heart of Paul. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he said this, "'Woe is me if I preach not the gospel.'" Paul had a heart that ached for the lost. And my prayer is that we would as well. You know, usually when we first get saved, right, we, we just, we, we like to say we're on fire for the Lord. We just can't help but talk about the Lord because we have this new relationship with the Lord. It's kind of like uh, the first time we had a relationship with our significant other, you know, our, our, our spouse, our wife, or our husband, or maybe uh, you're, you're now in, in that dating realm, you know, you've found that person you want to be the rest of your life. And here's what you do. You tell everybody about it. You can't help but tell everybody, man, I met this guy, he's great. Or I met this girl, and you talk about him, and then you're, you're married, and you're sharing with everybody, man, or, you know, you're in love, right? And that's how it is when a person comes to Christ. When I first came to Christ, man, I couldn't help but tell everybody about him. The Lord is so awesome. He saved me. He took me out of all the drugs and all the ungodly living. And, man, I'm so happy to, to know him. And we share our faith. It just naturally comes out. It's not even something forced. It just comes out. But what can happen over the years, especially as we get a little bit older, uh, we, we tend to fall into patterns. And we're not evangelizing. And here's the problem. If you don't evangelize, you will fossilize spiritually. You do. You, you become the frozen chosen. You know what I mean? You're saved, but you're like, yes, yeah, so I've been saved now 40 years. And, you know, after you've walked with the Lord as long as I have, you'll calm down. Really? I don't want to be like you. I'm sorry. I want to be on fire for Jesus, you know. So this is something that we need to encourage ourselves and remind ourselves, listen, there are many that don't know the Lord. And even though we may not be called to go to another country or many places as the Apostle Paul did, God has placed us in a place of influence wherever that is. Wherever you travel, wherever you work, wherever you shop, wherever you go, that is your sphere of influence. And Jesus says, let your light shine. Because if you don't, think about those people that will never perhaps hear the gospel. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Oswald Smith, I think, captures this idea as he illustrates the feeding of the 5,000 in maybe a different way. He said, what if this happened? Imagine the people are seated in their orderly rows. 
before Jesus, in his hands are the loaves and fish from the little lad's lunch. Gathered around, of course, are the disciples. He breaks the bread and he gives it to the disciples and he says, take it to the crowds. And they take the food and they go out to the first rows and they fed the people and they come back for more. Then they return to the same nearby group. A few fragments get passed behind to the others um, and then they come back for more food and they go back to the same rows. Soon those in the front rows are stuffed while those behind are a little tantalized with a few fragments that drift their way and the other groups of 50 and 100 way in the back get nothing. They wait. Back go the disciples for more. Back they go again, baskets loaded to the same few rows. The people there have enough. They begin to store food in their pockets. I'll take this home for dinner tonight. Another says, I'll put this in a museum. People will love to pay to see this in the future. Another says, I think I can take a few baskets and I can sell it. This is the best bread and fish ever. Meanwhile, those in the back are getting a little restless. Others are starving. Back go the disciples for more. Back they go to the same rows. People are now fighting over the food. Some are even throwing it angrily at one another. And this is what he writes. Meanwhile, the great mass of people sitting in the back starve. Could it be that way in regard to the gospel? That's his point. Hey, we come here, we get saved, we come in here, we come in every single Sunday. We get fed and we get fed and we get fed and we get fed. But are we passing that on to other people? Are we sharing our faith? Or could it be that people are starving? Listen, people are starving for the truth. As we will sit here through this hour and 15, hour and 20 minute service, there will be cars driving by us, probably 80% of them lost. They don't know Jesus. Don't know Jesus. I think about that all the time as I'm here. I work here. I'm here. (laughs) I spend more time, I think, here than I do even in my own home. And I think about that. That bothers me. I need to do everything I can. This was Paul. He was determined. He says, let us now go. I love that. I love his heart. More people need to hear this truth, you know. So he says, let's go. Look at again at the verse 30. He says, let's go and visit the brethren in every city where we've preached already the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. So he says, well, let's first of all, retrace our steps. Why is that? Because Paul saw the importance of discipleship. He realized that the importance of helping a person in their walk is not blowing, you know, sharing your faith, blowing through one city and then moving on to another. It's not like, well, it's like sharing someone and leading them to Christ saying, hey, God bless you, brother, here's a Bible. Hope everything works out, see you later. That would not be helpful. We want to hang around. We want to answer some of their questions. We want to help them in whatever we know and pass it on to them. So listen, people have asked me in the past, what, what's your evangelism program like? They you know, like putting labels on things. And I like to say this, I teach the Bible. What do you mean you teach the Bible? Yeah, because listen, first of all, when you teach the Bible, people will get saved. And then those who are saved will get discipled in the deeper things of God. And then after that, they go so excited about their faith, they go share that with others. I mean, that's part of our vision here as a church. Our vision here at Calvary is very simple. Worship, win, disciple, sin. We worship the Lord. That's how we started. We seek to win people to know Jesus Christ. We disciple them in God's word, and then we send them out. You're going to be leaving here in a little bit, and you're going to go out, and what you should be doing is sharing your faith. Because you're full, you see. My pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, always said, healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. I found that to be true. I have found that to be true all the time. So the best way to evangelize is not necessarily running all over the place, but it's sharing your faith and then helping them, discipling them in the faith. Paul put it this way. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, listen very carefully because it's very, very good. It's insightful. Paul is writing to Timothy and he says this, the things that you heard from me among many witnesses, the same I want you to commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So that, it, that passage is what I call reproducing reproducers. 
You don't spend your time discipling someone that's never going to take it and do anything with it. You find people that are hungry for the truth. You pour into them, and then you tell them what you've learned from me. You pass on to other people who will faithfully do the same thing. It's reproducing reproducers. We're all called to do that, and that's how Paul lived. Paul was always excited to get people saved. And think about this. Billy Graham Association put out the stats years ago. They said that most people that come forward in our crusades, about 6% really follow Jesus Christ from that point on. Now, I said, that's not very good statistic. Well, of course, we still want to share our faith. We don't get discouraged by that. We understand sometimes it's just an emotional thing or whatever it is. But, but it does support the point that most people don't come to Christ at a crusade. You know how most of us came to Christ? Somebody shared their faith with us. Someone invested time in us and walked us along and maybe lived it out. But that's how we come to Christ. So think about this. Paul is going to go on further in his second mission endeavor. But before he does that, he goes back to where he's been to help disciple them. That's very important. Now, let's move on to a second point. Effective evangelism comes when we exercise also discernment. And, of course, this is any kind of service for God, whether it's evangelism or anything, discernment. Here's Paul and Barnabas. They're about to embark on their second missionary endeavor, but there's a conflict. They find themselves at a crossroads. Verse 37, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take him with them, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia, and had not come or gone with them to do the work. So here you have Barnabas. He wants to take John Mark with him. But Paul discerns here that this is not going to be good at this time. We, we shouldn't do it. Why? John Mark wasn't ready. He, he wasn't spiritually mature. If you remember back in chapter 13, John Mark didn't like the way things were going on that first missionary trip. And halfway through, he abandoned ship. He left them in a lurch so that they were one man short the whole rest of the way. And so in order to effectively minister on his second trip, Paul knew that, you know, we need someone else. We mean men of faith. He discerned at this time, John Mark was not ready. Now, on the other hand, let me say this. It's no surprise that uh, Barnabas championed John Mark to go with him. You want to know why? Remind you, Barnabas was his uncle. And on top of that, Barnabas was simply the kind of man who always saw the best of others. And remember, Barnabas is not his name. His name is Justice. Barnabas was his given nickname. The term means son of encouragement. So he was just the kind of guy that looked for the best. And, and Barnabas was insistent, no, we should take John Mark. It'll work out. It'll be fine. It says he was determined to do it, which means he kept on insisting. But Paul was equally insistent that they don't bring him. The result, verse 39, there was a contention. How about that? Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Man, that's a bummer, right? Here you have, at least up to this point, the greatest evangelistic team in the history of the church, and it's broken up. Man, Satan loves to do this. How true to life, right? That's often how he likes to work, right? He wants to bring in a schism, bring in a problem. Now, I do believe that at this point, Barnabas was wrong. A few reasons. Number one, first of all, Paul had apostolic authority. Barnabas should have submitted to Paul's discernment and judgment as the leader. Secondly, Mark doesn't end up going with Paul, by the way, which only validates God's plan. And, and thirdly, when you get down to verse 40, we see that Paul takes Silas with him and they are commended by the church. They had the backing of the church. However, there is no such mentioning of Barnabas and Mark. Now, here's the good thing. Or the beautiful thing, I say, God uses all things for the good, right? Romans 8, 28. He works through the frailties of men to accomplish his sovereign purposes. And so here's the thing. God had another young man in mind for Paul. His name is Timothy. 
And when we get to chapter 16, Paul takes Timothy with him. He finds this man, Timothy. That was part of God's plan. Now, what about John Mark? Does God just abandon him because he blew it? No. Here's the great thing. God wanted to take Barnabas to disciple John Mark better so he would be profitable in the future. And that's exactly what happens. Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, would you bring Mark with you? For he is now profitable to me for ministry. Oh yeah, he was profitable even to the Lord because God would use Mark to actually pin the gospel of Mark. How about that? So God sometimes has to take us through these times where he has to work on us a little bit more. But the point I want you to see here is it's important for us to be discerning when we serve the Lord. And we need to always be prayerful of who we link ourselves with in ministry. That's something that's vitally, I'd have to tell you, it's vitally important to me who I link myself up to, who I'm going to disciple, who I'm going to pour my my time and invest time with, and those who I link up with in ministries because you wanna have people like-minded, people who are spiritual, people who are godly. It's very important. So as a result of the contention, verse 39, notice it says Barnabas at the very end took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Off they went. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Now, this text suggests to us that Paul, uh, Mark, I should say, Mark and Barnabas kind of left quickly without the blessing of the church, while Paul wisely sought the blessings and the prayers of the church before leaving. And here we have another great lesson. You see, think about this. Even though Paul was commissioned by Jesus himself, it doesn't get any better than that. That's all you need, right? You got Jesus He was commissioned by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Even though he had that, Paul never functioned independently from the church and independently of accountability. He wanted to make sure that he had the blessings, the covering, the prayers, the accountability of others. So this is a great lesson for us. Certainly is for me that no matter what God calls me to, and it should be the same, whatever God calls you to, if you're serving here in the church or you have a parachurch ministry, you want to make sure that you have accountability and that it comes under the blessing of the church. I I, I can only speak for my own life in many occasions, but I'll I'll just speak of one. When I first came out here uh, to start, you know, the church here at, at Calvary in Houston, The first thing I felt, you know, when God was calling me is I prayed. And my prayer was, first of all, God, are you sure you got the right person? (laughs) Honestly, are you sure you've got the right person? It was very uh, overwhelming to think, you know, I was leaving a very comfortable uh, position as an assistant pastor, very comfortable, but I knew God was moving me and wanted to use me to pioneer church, but it was scary. Um, But after that, after I felt God's confirmation, after God gave me scripture, the first thing I did is I sought godly counsel. Men older than me, men that had been ministry longer than I had, and sought their counsel, sought their wisdom, and actually asked them, "Do do you think that God is calling me? I wanted honesty. There has to be transparency. They said, yes, then I coveted their prayers. Then I met with my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, and I took on the covering and the accountability of Calvary Chapel. And I think that is all very important. So if there's ever a time where God calls you in your life to serve in any area, in any capacity, you want God's blessing. You want the counsel of godly people and you want God's blessing. Seek the confirmation, the support, and the covering of where it is that you call your church. So important. Now let me also add here that we have had people then where we've had this same experience. We've had people here now that we've sent out as missionaries or we've sent out as pastors and, and we've sent them out. We've, you know, we've laid hands on them and said, these men, uh, these people have been commissioned by God. We see that, we recognize that, we partner with them and they've been sent out, praise the Lord. I've also seen other people leave our church that have had not the blessing of God to go out and do things all on their own And I distinguish those two groups. There are those that are sent out, sense, and there are whence, you know? 
they went. They went out. They went off on their own thing for their own endeavors. And most of the time, that crashes and burns. It's really sad. So Paul is departing on a second missionary endeavor, and he wants God's blessing. That's so good. Commended by the church. Verse 41, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So now he heads first north and then heads west. He's now skirting the coast of modern-day Turkey at the time known as Asia Minor. Now, that leads us to a third thing we see here, and that is uh, the proper decisions. Uh, it's important in an evangelism or any service to the Lord to make right decisions. So check this out, verse 1. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. There we find him. The son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. So she was a Jewish believer, a Christian, but his father, he was an unbeliever, and he was Greek. Now, Timothy was well spoken of by the brethren who are at Lystra and Iconium. So here we meet Timothy for the first time. We believe that Timothy came to the Lord, came to Christ in Paul's first missionary endeavor to this area that would have been anywhere from two or three years earlier. And think about this. In that short period of time, Timothy's influence, his godly character, is made evident to not only his hometown, but even surrounding cities of Lystra and Iconium. That's pretty amazing. And Paul hears about this young man. He's, recommend, he's been recommended to take him with him. And, you know, what better replacement for John Mark than this young man, Timothy? And it tells us in verse 3, Paul wanted to have him go with him, and Timothy agreed. And what we find from this moment on is this beautiful relationship and that Timothy becomes Paul's protege. He becomes his son in the faith. And so Timothy, we find throughout the book of Acts and in many of Paul's letters, whenever there was a problem church, he sent Timothy. Timothy, go take care of that problem. Then he'd come back. Hey, now would you stay a little longer over there and take care of that? Paul writes of Timothy in Philippians 2.20 saying this. This is pretty powerful words. I have no one like-minded like Timothy who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. So unlike John Mark at this time, Timothy was exactly who Paul was looking for, and he was added to the team. But then we see, read something interesting in the rest of this verse. Then he took him, that's Timothy, and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, at first you read this and go, well, what's going on? Is Paul reverting back to legalism? I mean, I thought the church just settled this issue in Jerusalem before taking off, that we're not saved through circumcision or dietary laws, but by grace alone. Yeah, so why is he circumcising Timothy? Well, it tells us why in this verse. Because of the Jews who were in that region. He, Timothy, who's half Jewish, yes, but he's also Greek. He's also going to be ministering to all the Jews when he goes into synagogues with Paul. For they all knew that his father was Greek or Gentile. Now, Paul then is not compromising theology, but he is conforming to that high priority, which is the law of love. Timothy is going to be working with both Jew and Gentile converts. And Timothy was both. His father Greek, his mother Jew, as it says here. Now, a Gentile is going to have no problem receiving the gospel from him or even from a Jew. That's already been established repeatedly through the book of Acts. But a Jew would very easily have a problem receiving you know, the gospel or listening to anybody who's this Greek guy is a Christian. And, you know, who is this guy? I don't care. He's a half Jew, you know. So Paul says, why not make you a whole Jew? Let's, let's have you circumcised. And so the Gentiles could be reached. He could also reach the Jews. So here's the thing. It was not a matter of salvation. No one is saved through circumcision. Paul knew that. He taught that. But Timothy did this in order not to be a stumbling block to the Jews he was seeking to reach. Now, Paul would write about this subject in a much broader way because it doesn't just speak about Gentile trying to reach Jew, 
but in many other areas. So Paul would write about this in 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 19. This is what he writes. For though I'm free from all men, God has given me many freedoms. I've made myself a servant to all men that I might win many. To the Jews, I've become a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those under the law. To those who are without the law as without the law. Now he's not saying I'm a lawbreaker, not without regard to God, but under the law towards Christ that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now, I've heard people today misquote that scripture and say, well, you know, we don't teach out of the Bible and we don't do this because we're trying to become all things to all men and we do all kinds of immoral things. That, that's not what Paul's talking about. I think we understand this in context, what he's saying. He's saying, I'm seeking to conciliate what, in whatever I, way I can in a biblical way to reach these people for Christ. That was his heart. So this is something that I think then lands on our doorstep if we're going to make this practical. Could this be something that God is speaking to us about or to me personally? Think about it. Are you willing to give up a freedom that you might have if it aids in reaching someone to Christ? Because sometimes our freedoms, and we've talked about this before, can become a stumbling block, right? I mean, I, I, let's, let, we bring up the subject of drinking. I think we did this. We talked about drinking, cigarettes, all that kind of stuff, either last week or the week before. But, but in regard to drinking, let's say, hey, the Bible says, Pastor, I know the Bible. The Bible says don't be drunk with wine. It doesn't say you can't drink. Okay, yeah, right, it does. But there are many other passages that talk about stumbling your brother. So let's say you've got that freedom and you're off having your beer right there and, and wherever you're having it and here are a bunch of people right there and here's a newly converted believer and he just came out of alcoholism. And he, he can't, he goes, well, I, what's going on here? I, I, I can't get this. And, and so your freedom has become his stumbling block. And, and that blocks him. Or let's say he's not a, even a Christian. And, but you're trying to witness to him, and he's saying, even more so, well, how are you any different from me? Well, I've been set free, brother. I've been set free. Well, it doesn't look like you're set free right now, brother. It looks like you, you might have a problem with drinking. Well, no, I don't. I just have the, and you're, you're in this arm. But that is eliminated completely if you're willing to give that up. So it, all I'm saying is these are things that effective evangelism involves wise decisions. There are going to be sometimes, that's just one, there are going to be times where God says, don't do this. Give this up. Or he may say, I want you to actually do something for that person in order to help them. Let me give you a classic example. I, I quoted him earlier in the study, J. Hudson Taylor. He was a he was the first missionary to inland China in the early 1800s. He was from England, and what he found as he was going there, he wasn't able to lead many people to Christ, though he had learned Mandarin to speak Chinese. And then he began to talk to someone, and they said, well, the way you look, the way you dress, it's like you really don't care about us. He was wearing his English Western wear. So what he did is, in order to win these people for Christ, he got rid of that. He donned the garb of that time, which they would wear a long gown, and the men would shave their head except for having what was called a queue, a long ponytail. And that's how he dressed. And people think, I can't believe you're doing this. You're acting like the pagans are. He got a lot of flack for it. Yeah, but he also led many of those people to Christ. And so many of the Christians today are, should, are, are thanked because of the work that J. Hudson Taylor began 200 years ago. So the point is this. We need to be wise in the decisions we make of the things that we need to abstain from or things God may call us to do if we want to reach people for Christ. And that's what Paul was doing here in regard to Timothy. So good evangelism, effective evangelism, involves, of course, discipleship. It definitely involves discernment and at times making wise decisions, helpful decisions. Now, there's a fourth thing in our outline, and that's the proper, proper declaration or the proper message. I mean, if you don't have the, wrong me the right message, you're, you're never going to get off the ground. So what did Paul share with these churches? Verse 4, as they went out through the cities, they delivered to them the decree to keep which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. 
Now, we looked at all those decrees last week in detail, but the sum of it was this. Listen, you're saved by grace through faith. It's not things you have to do, can't do, must do, but we're saved by grace through faith, period, right? Paul wrote about this in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You ought to have it memorized. We are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of our works, lest any of us would boast. Now, if there's any message you wanna make sure you have right, it's that one. Why? Because that's what makes Christianity unique to all of the religions in the world. Every religion in the world is based on what you do or shouldn't do. But Christianity, which by the way is not a religion, though people say that, it's a relationship with the living God. Religion, every religion is man's attempt to reach God. How do we reach God? Well, if you do this and this, oh, I, I get close to my God. If you do this, I'll, I'll get close to my, if you don't do that, you get close to your God. That's what religion is, man's attempt to reach God. Christianity is God's success in reaching man through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it's not based on what we do, but it's based on what he has done. So this was the message of Paul. And notice it says, verse five, so the churches were strengthened in faith. So all those churches that he was now going back to were strengthened in that truth, which was awesome. Strengthened in faith and they increased in numbers daily. So not only were they strengthening the churches through discipleship, but other people were getting saved. So he was retracing his steps and many people were getting saved as well. It was awesome. By the way, I love this word strengthened. Uh, it's a medical term in the original language. In Greek, it's teruo. Um, for example, it's used in uh, Acts chapter five uh, when Peter heals the lame man. Uh, it says he was lame and his bones and his ankles then received strength. It's the same word. So Paul and his team were bringing spiritual strength. But notice how they were strengthened, they, or what they were strengthened. They weren't strengthened by uh, presentations, programs, but they were strengthened in their faith. And how do you get strengthened in your faith? Right, good question. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul says, now brethren, I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. This is what builds us up. This is what strengthens us, God's word. So Paul and his team declared the right message. In doing so, they strengthened the churches and even more were saved. Awesome. Now finally, we have what I put in your outline, the right direction, the right direction. Uh, if you're sharing your faith, you can be reaching the right people, the right, have the right calling, the right message, um, but you also need to be going to the right place. Where does God want you going, right? So Paul here experiences the direction of the Holy Spirit. Notice verse six. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and through the region of Galatia, so we have the book of Galatians. The book of Galatia is not written to a church, but a region of churches, the region of Galatia. But they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So now they'd gone to this area before, but the Holy Spirit is saying, no, skip those areas and keep going, which seems kind of odd, right? I mean, doesn't God want us to reach everyone? Yes, of course. But God had a specific plan in mind now. So Paul and Barnabas had been to those places, and they, but this was now not the time to go there a second time. I want you to keep going. Verse seven, and after they had gone, come to Mycenae, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. More closed doors. So it seems like all of a sudden God is closing doors. Now, I'm just trying to think of the team. I've got a young man in Timothy who's never traveled and done this before. I've got Silas. He's the first time on the team. And they're probably thinking, what's wrong with Paul? Man, I thought we were in this to share the loss, and now all of a sudden the guy stopped. He's booping out. I don't know what's going on with him. But I think that Paul was probably thinking the same thing too. Lord, what are you doing? I've never experienced it before. Why, why are we doing this? But he faithfully heeded the Holy Spirit's direction. Verse eight, so passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. Now, if you look at your map, and, and I've encouraged you throughout the book of Acts to do this, and especially in Paul's journeys, they're in the back of your Bible. I'm sure almost every Bible has the, uh, the Apostle Paul's journeys. 
There are four of them. They're probably in four different colors, so you can distinguish them, and they have to do that because, again, Paul often retraces his steps. So if you look where Paul goes, now he's gone throughout all Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and he reaches Troas. Troas at the very end. That's the end of the continent. And now there's an ocean there. The other side, well, that's Europe. That's Europe. And so God has a plan. Now, let me just stop right here and say this. I find this passage to be very practical. And, and the reason why I say that, because I think you will all agree with me. There are some times we don't understand why God is closing doors in our life. Why God is saying, no, 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 we don't understand. God, I thought this was the perfect job. Why didn't I get that job? God, I made my application to this one particular school. This was the school. I know it. And yet the door closed. I'm not going there. Or I, I, I've been putting in to buy a house. I, this was the house. This was the place. I know someone who's a friend of mine, they've been looking at houses lately, and every single door seems to be getting closed. I said, well, that's good news. God didn't want you there. Right? Sometimes it makes it very often. And we should be happy that God closes doors. Psalm 37, 23 is a great verse. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he does delight in his way. God does delight to lead us in, in his ways. And so our steps are ordered by the Lord. But I would also add, so are our stops. Our stops and our steps are ordered by the Lord if we're seeking his will and if we're being led and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So sometimes he stops us in our tracks. Sometimes he closes doors. I think of Revelation chapter three and verse seven. It says, God opens doors that no man can close. And we say, praise God to that. He's opening doors. Awesome. And we fail to remember the rest of the verse because it goes on to say, and he closes doors that no man can open. I don't like that, Bart. I wanted to go through that door. Well, not if God didn't want you. It had been disaster. I, I, I'll tell you what. The more I walk with Jesus, the more I'm so thankful for closed doors. In fact, I pray for that all the time. Lord, if this is not you, would close the door. I'm really sensing, I believe it, but if it's not, I, I don't even want to trust myself. Close the door. So that's a regular prayer of mine, as well as praying God's will in my life. That's a regular prayer as well. I've learned as well something, you know, things an old man says, right? I'm just telling you, things, walk, here's another one. I want God's will in my life. Why would I ever not want God's will in my life? Why? Oh, I got to do this thing. I, 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 I want to do it. Well, not if it's God's will. Why would you? Because it's going to end a disaster. So I want closed doors. I want God's will. And so this is the place that leads to God's blessing and fruitfulness. Listen, let me give you a true story. True story. And uh, I, I had lost the article, so I can't remember the name of the city, but it's a true story. Uh, there's a group of people living in a small town in the south, they all grew up, it was, a, it was a cotton town, so all they did, all the farmers grew cotton, and they lived successfully for years all off their crops, but one year, they got boll weevils, and it didn't destroy some of the flocks, it destroyed every single person's flocks, uh, uh, crops, I should say, and um, some of them were facing bankruptcy, they didn't have any extra money laid aside. What are they going to do? They, they've only grown cotton before. One of the farmers had been doing some research. And he suggested, I suggest we grow peanuts. What? We're going from, but what would even, why would you even say? He says, because the boll weevils are still here destroying our cop, crops, but boll weevils don't like peanuts. Most of the people thought it was a crazy idea at first because people don't like change, right? That's how people are. But finally, one gave in, which gave in the other, and the whole town did it. They planted peanuts. Well, guess what? They made more money off their first crop of peanuts than they had ever in their history growing cotton. The soil it was just perfect for peanuts. So you know what they did? It's true. They erected like this six-foot bronze bull weevil in the center of their town. It's there to say, you know, and, and the whole thing is this, thank God for the bull weevil. And I would say that in our life. Thank God for the bull weevils in our life. Thank God for the closed doors. Thank God for the stops of the Lord. 
He's keeping us from something that may do us harm or that are not going to bless us, you know, someday down the line. So this is exactly what Paul had been encountering. He's hitting one stop after another. I thought I was here to share the gospel. You are, Paul. I got another plan. He's right here in Troas at the end of the continent. And as he's there, verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul the night. So he goes to sleep. God gives him a vision. A man from Macedonia. By the way, Macedonia is just across the way in the continent of Europe. He stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Wow, God opened up the door. He sees this person in this vision saying, come and share the gospel. And so verse 10, now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so realizing that all these other doors have been closed and it was God's intent to take the gospel further than Paul was even thinking. I, I just thought, man, we're doing a great job doing this. And God said, no, I want to do so much more. Sometimes we get frustrated when God wants to do so much more. And we're gonna see next week as we continue on the great, incredible fruit. And it doesn't come just like, oh, it's so easy. No, there's opposition, a lot more opposition. But in that, God shows himself great on their behalf. So here we have five wonderful principles that make for effective service, ministry, evangelism. We should be involved in discipleship, even though we're evangelizing and serving the Lord. We need to use and exercise discernment. We need to pray so that we make wise decisions. We need to make sure we have the right message, right? The gospel of Christ. And in all things, we need the Holy Spirit's direction, right? Praise the Lord for that. Now, I wanna close this morning with something a little bit different. And uh, I, I came across this this week. Um, it, it's five lies, it was an article, five lies that Americans are believing today. Uh, a survey was taken, now I would say these are lies that the whole world experiences, but the survey was just taken in the United States of thousands of people. And this is what the survey found. Uh, the minimum was 67%, all the percentages, all in the upper percent. This is what Americans believe. Number one, having faith matters more than what faith you have. Having a faith matters more than what faith you have. In other words, it doesn't really matter what you believe in as long as you believe in something. There's a problem. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one will come to heaven except through me, right? Uh, line number two, all faiths are of equal value. No, Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind whereby we must be saved. There's only one way. Line number three, there is no absolute truth. No, absolutely there is no absolute truth. Well, then you've just contradicted yourself with that statement. That's an absolute statement. But the fact is we can know truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, your word is truth. Line number four, morality is subjective. Oh, man, yeah, that's, that's the big uh, message of the day. It's called tolerance. Oh, yeah, we should all be tolerant. You can could, you could live however you want, do whatever you want, because after all, morality is subjective, whatever you think. But here's what God says in Galatians 6, 7, 8. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's he's gonna reap. If you're sowing to your flesh, whatever feels good, whatever you want, you'll of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to the Lord, you will reap everlasting life. And then lie number five, people are basically good. Are you kidding me? Are you, are you living in the same planet we're living on? Are you reading the same news and seeing all, are you kidding me? People are basically good. No, I have a news flash. Romans 3, 23, the Bible tells us all have sin. All of us sin. And we come far short of the glory of God. But there is a solution, right? As we close, there is a solution. Faith in Jesus Christ. This was the message that Paul relentlessly sought to tell as many people as he could. And I pray that we will do the same thing. People are lost. People are believing lies like that. And all we have to do is share truth with them. 
We don't have to be angry. We don't have to argue with them. We could be as kind and as gentle as possible, but tell them the truth. And now they may get angry and walk away. That's okay. But we need to share the truth. Maybe you're here today and you've, you know, you're saved, but you walked away from the truth. You, you walked away and you kind of believe some of these things because you've been out of fellowship so long. And the world starts rubbing off on you, you know? And, and it starts getting on you. And then all of a sudden you don't realize that you've gotten quite a distance from the Lord, but you're back in church today. Praise the Lord, you're here. I'm so happy. I, I would pray though that you'd make a recommitment to the life, to, in your life to Jesus today. Today you'd say, Lord, wait a second, I can no longer go back. I can't, I can't live like the world, I'm in the world. Jesus said you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And so maybe you need to make a recommitment to the, to the Lord today. Or maybe you've never asked Christ in your life. Can I, can I just encourage you? Listen, in this world, there's just, it, it's so empty. We try to find happiness in the things of the world, but it's so empty. You know, we, yeah, I mean, if I just have that new car, you get that new car, you know, in 10 years, you're like, this is a piece of junk. And we do it on bigger purchases, maybe not as soon, but we get that house. If we only had that house, you get your first house, and it's like, man, we need another house. This thing is just not fitting our needs. And we do that with everything. We could see it in our two-year-olds. Buy your kid a, at two years old, you get them a gift. You know where that gift is in about a year? It's piled up in a corner. Ah, piece of junk. That's how we are, because it doesn't satisfy. Listen, the wisest man in the world to ever live, Solomon said, you know what? He, he had it all. You know what he said? It's just grasping for the wind. It, 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 it doesn't sustain, it doesn't fulfill. Here's the thing that fulfills a life in Christ. He gives you a purpose to live. He gives you meaning in life. He gives you what's called the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and all these other things he adds to you. So no longer settle for the substitute of this world. If you've never given your life to Jesus, listen, there's lots of satisfied customers here and we want you to be part of that. I'm just one beggar who found some good bread in Jesus Christ and I wanna encourage you. Listen, I found the source. You ought to join it. Become part of that satisfied customer, right? God is good. So we're gonna pray, and I wanna give you an opportunity this morning just to ask Jesus into your life. Just say, Lord, I, I, I've been trying to do my own, find happiness on my own. I need you. He'll meet you here this morning. We're gonna pray, and I'm gonna ask you to come up. Or maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ because too much world has been sticking on you, and you need to get freed up of all that stuff. Then come back to Jesus. So let's pray.